Um, I'm Meredith Helm, um, who I know most of you all. Um, so thank you so much for joining today. Um, we are super excited to have um, Elisa Dietrich back from Mercer and um, her colleague David Miller. Um, and the topic is very, very relevant in what we're all dealing with today. Um, but before we get started, um, I did want to welcome um, the guests that have joined us. I know we have a few that um, are new to our group, so we hope that you will find this event informative and we'll consider joining BCA perhaps um, in the coming year. Um, as always, I did want to make you aware that we are um, looking for new board members and we hope that you would consider joining our team. Um, we do have available positions listed on our website, so if you would just uh, take a look at those, let us know what questions you have. Um, also be aware that you do have some perks if you are a board member, such as a discounted membership and also um, additional certification credits. So let us know if you have any questions or more importantly, if you are interested in a position. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Lisa Dietrich and David Miller, both from Mercer. Um, Lisa um, was with us not too long ago, so for some of you all, you may remember her, so I was super excited that she agreed to come back and speak with us. Um, Lisa is a senior principal and compensation and benefits consultant at Mercer, um, and uh, David is a senior associate and both are located in Louisville. I won't say the Louisville office because I know none, they're not in the office. Um, so they are going to discuss compensation planning as well as flexible work arrangements and other strategies employers are utilizing as they adapt to COVID-19 pandemic. So as I mentioned, I know this is a very relevant topic in today's ever-changing work environment. Um, so I appreciate them coming on and, and sharing with us on this topic. Um, if you have questions, um, certainly submit those in the chat box and um, we will stop for questions potentially along the way, but definitely at the end. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Lisa and David. All right, thank you, Meredith. And I really appreciate everybody's time today and thanks for inviting us back. Um, hopefully we have some good information that we can share with you today um, that will be helpful as you know, many of you are probably going through year-end budgeting process and you know, dealing with the you know, ever-changing work environment that the pandemic has brought on. So we're, we're hoping to share some of those insights that we as a firm have worked with, um, seen with our clients, and also um, we've been doing multiple, multiple surveys, and I'm sure some of you have, have probably participated in some of those surveys over the years, so we do appreciate all that information. And it helps us to be able to, to speak to groups about what we're seeing in the market. Um, so as Meredith mentioned, we're going to go over a couple of things today. Um, the first section that David is going to cover is looking at compensation planning, you know, essentially what we saw in 2020 and adjustments that companies made in reaction to the economic environment brought on by the pandemic, particularly. Um, and also what we're seeing a companies doing for compensation budgets in 2021. Uh, and then I'll switch over and we'll cover a section on flexible working and all the different variations of what that means and what companies have done and what we're seeing evolving in that area, you know, as far as flexible working arrangements, um, caregiver support, and things like that. Um, and as she said, we'll, we'll end with Q&A, but as, as folks have comments or want to ask questions along the way, you know, we don't view this as a very formal presentation, so please feel free to stop and share your stories or ask questions as we go along. Um, so with that, I will turn over the compensation planning to David. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so to start off, I mean, it's very evident uh, what the impact has been on our economy and our lifestyles uh, in terms of the pandemic. Um, but want to go over a few areas where we've seen uh, changes to compensation processes. And what we found is the impact just hasn't been quite as significant on those as uh, the economy and lifestyles, for instance. Um, so uh, as we you know, look back to March and April when things kind of started off, um, one in four organizations uh, initiated pay reductions of some sort, typically in, in pockets, be they temporary in nature or um, just for certain 
uh, you know, select industries or, or select groups of employees within the organization. Uh, however, due to the timing in part, um, a little over two thirds of organizations went ahead and moved forward with their merit processes. So a lot of organizations have that, um, you know, February, March, April timeframe for when they're providing pay increases same goes for when they're looking to pay out bonuses with their bonus programs. So about 80% uh, went ahead and paid out bonuses given where they were in that process, just too far down the road to kind of put the brakes on. Um, the impact probably would have been a little bit more significant had you know, COVID-19 hit you know, in the fall of 2019 um, in the US more significantly. Uh, but taking a look at just year over year 2019 versus 2020 market data in Mercer's benchmark database, we're still finding about a 3% year over year increase. So some of that information, yes, a little bit of an impact, but, but minimal in comparison to what some folks thought uh, this would be. Go ahead and move to the next slide there, Lisa. <clears throat> well, let me try again. <laughs> Technology works great when you know how to use it, and clearly I don't. So, <laughs> sorry about that, folks. There we go. There we go. Yeah. And so here we just wanted to highlight, you know, there are pockets of the market that are uh, moving a bit quicker than others, despite everything going on with the pandemic. And here in this table on the left, you can see um, across uh, job groupings, job families, across levels, We've got um, market data showing that compensation jumped by, you know, four and a half, five percent for some of these roles. Uh, I imagine some of you are kind of keying in on that HR operations team lead, 6.5 percent, saying, let me write that down for a further internal conversation. <laughs> but, um, uh, and then off to the right, we wanted to just highlight, <clears throat> you know, there's certain hot jobs that are really uh, moving interestingly and compared to others. Uh, we're looking at software, you know, IT engineering in this case, two roles in that space. And um, on the upper end of the market on the high tech industry, uh, this AI machine learning position, the intermediate level professional is actually jumping up higher than, you know, your expert level software engineer. Uh, so just wanted to highlight that there's some key positions that are, are jumping up a little bit more than others in this instance. Uh, but looking forward to 2021, the, the question that everyone has had, what are folks gonna do uh, next year? And usually Mercer will have our compensation planning statistics for both 2020 and projected 2021 earlier in the year. Uh, what we found on that initial phase of the comp planning survey was that so many organizations just hadn't finalized their decisions yet, or even, you know, budgeted, had proposed budgets for 2021 at that point. So we conducted pulse surveys each month to kind of keep a pulse on what are folks planning to do and, and let's see when we have a significant amount of information for 2021. And uh, Mercer just released that in September. So what we're finding now is about 60% have projected 2021 budgets. Um, you know, about a third still still undecided, but it's fairly minimal, you know, less than 10% if you add that five and three, uh, those that either will not have a merit, merit cycle or are freezing salaries across the board. So in general, you know, people are either planning on moving forward with their typical process or they haven't quite decided um, what they're doing there. Uh, it, it is notable, if you want to jump to the next slide, Lisa, that among those companies that have thrown out a, a 2021 budget, only one in 10 have that approved by leadership. So this is very much still in flux and we're, we're continuing to um, survey organizations to see what 2021 looks like. And uh, it may shift a little bit, but for now it, it appears that most people are kind of staying the course. Uh, then, as we take a look at what the actual, the, the average increases are, um, given the pandemic, uh, you'll see on the left that if we take a look at those that are providing merit, planning to provide merit increases in 2021, 
the average increase is 2.8%. Uh, so not too far off of what we've seen in the past. It's typically been around you know, 3.0. If you factor in those that have said they're freezing salaries, so including the zeros in those statistics, that average increase dips down to 2.5%. Uh, and you can see below that in, in our Pulse surveys, we do ask, what has the impact been? Please categorize the impact on your organization, uh, the pandemic that is. And so, as you would imagine, those with high financial impact, that decreases a little bit lower with, with more folks freezing uh, pay, whereas those that haven't had much of a financial impact, um, it doesn't really have an effect as much when you factor in those that are, that are freezing pay in terms of the average merit increase. So you know, the opposite ends of the spectrums, you, you've got the airlines that are, that are really struggling. Um, and then you've got folks, we, we've got clients in the insurance industry that we're talking to that are trying to figure out what to do with a surplus with there being less claims and not as many people driving, particularly in those summer months. Um, so it's interesting just to see from organization to organization what, what they're playing with for financials. Uh, off to the right, uh, that pie chart kind of indicates of those that are projecting an increase, only one in four are saying that those increases are gonna be smaller than the next year. So you might say, all right, if there is a shift down in the average pay increase, maybe it's that you know everybody's just providing a little less. This indicates that it's, it's more often the case that folks are planning to provide the same amount um, than, than, than smaller increases, but when you lump them all together, it creates that decrease from 2.8 to 2.5 percent. <throat> yeah, I'll chime in here. I think it, it is interesting, as David mentioned, that there, we have seen so much variability across industries. And over the last several months, um, you know, earlier on in, the, in this pandemic, you know, March, April, May, um, you know, David and I work with a fair amount of healthcare organizations. And, you know, every day there were stories about having to do furloughs and layoffs because everything shut down and elective surgeries that fund a lot of healthcare uh, organizations, you know, were put on hold indefinitely. And it just caused, you know, a huge financial burden on hospitals and health systems at the same time. They had to really pivot and try to figure out how to, you know, staff where they needed it, when they needed it. And that'll kind of go into the, the flexibility section we talked about. But, you know, within that, we saw a lot of, particularly at the executive level of, um, of cuts in pay. You know, that's been a big topic over this year at, the, at the, the management and executive level is, you know, in reaction to all the financial strain, having some cuts or, or pullbacks. And I'd say over the last few months, you know, we have seen some of those that were cut get reinstated. Um, there's been a variety of whether the reinstatement is just to go forward or whether there was actually, um, you know, things ended up being not as bad as we thought and back pay got made. Um, I've seen those situations. Um, and as David kind of mentioned too, you know, insurance is one that actually there, there have been pockets of industries that have done, you know, really well over the last several months. And, um, you know, the optics of so many things are important just because of the, the severity of everything and, and it goes back to you not just pay, but how your organization is reacting meets with branding and how you're presented to the, the, the world, really. And we've had some conversations even with clients that are doing really well, that even though they are um, maybe doing much better financially than they have been, they're actually still somewhat loath to give a lot of pay increases, whether it is for executives or broader employees. Um, just because they don't want to appear to be insensitive and kind of having a payday, if you will, on the backs of, you know, very tragic situation happening to a lot of other industries and just people all over the world. So it, it is kind of an interesting push and pull of what's affordable and the finances impacting what we're seeing in the market. But I think some of it, too, is also just really um, making sure that from the public standpoint, and particularly if you're a public company and, and proxy statements are, are coming out and, you're gonna, and there's you know, a lot of discussion about having to be very careful if you're modifying incentive plans or doing things like that um, in reaction to the economic environment, just to make sure that, that everything is aligned and you don't get a lot of negative feedback because we know that spreads like wildfire these days, the way information flows. All right, and then taking a look at what these average 
2021 merit increases look like across industries. Um, you see that bar on the left aligns with what we mentioned on the last slide, 2.8% um, on average, 2.5% when you factor in those freezing pay. Um, in general, it's fairly consistent, you know, ranging from 2.6 to 3.0 across various industries. There are some that are a little, hit a little bit harder with the impact of those freezing salaries. So looking at the light blue lines, you see in energy, it's closer to about 2% for that average increase when you factor in the zeros. Um, similarly, a bit low for uh, services and uh, some of the other categories as well. The other question is, what are, what are folks doing with pay structures? So typically, um, you know, it's about 70% of organizations are adjusting their pay structures annually to keep pace with the market, often by a percentage that's a bit less than their merit budget, so that folks are still progressing within their pay ranges. Um, the averages projected for 2021 are similar to what we've seen in the past, uh, around 2% or a little bit over 2% across industries. Um, of those that, you know, we, we asked the question again, how often are you uh, providing, are you increasing your structure? And um, it's still in, for the most part, annually for most, uh, those that aren't doing it annually, it's typically every other year. Um, there's a smaller population that are doing it just on an ad hoc basis as needed um, when they take a look at how it aligns with market. <clears throat> And then lastly, in terms of comp planning, so what are some of the actions you can take? Um, and we wanna encourage people to, to keep a pulse on the market. Uh, sometimes when things become difficult like this and priorities shift within the organization, folks will kind of stop taking a look at the market as often as they normally would, um, but it's still moving as, as we've seen from these numbers and sometimes in, in certain areas moving a lot more than others. Um, and you wanna stay agile as far as your compensation processes go. So, you know, there's a lot of curveballs with the uh, environment that we're in right now, be it timing of processes or, um, you know, surprises on where folks need to focus budgets. And so to the extent you can streamline some of the processes with respect to merit and other comp planning administration activities, um, that's helpful just to be able to move forward and react to changes in the market. Uh, and then lastly, make the most of your budget. So when we asked folks if they are varying their budget for 2021, you know, we found that a lot of folks don't plan to, but of those that are, um, over half of them said that uh, they're looking to, you know, differentiate a little bit more um, through the lens of performance and skills and, and the market. So um, really focusing their smaller budget on those that are performing well or those that are of critical need and 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 making sure that the piece that gets taken away um, are from those that are less of priority be it due to performance or just due to the due to the need at the organization for that type of role any questions on uh, you know any of the statistics that we've gone through here for for comp planning or um, you know, some of these, these points on what can be done uh, for actions going forward. Have folks already set their budgets or are many of you still in the process? You could put it in the chat if you want. We can yeah, kind of take we can, a little we can, we can give that way. Yeah, we can comment on it after people have a chance to, to mention, but curious what the, what the case is for this population. And we'll uh, can move forward to some of the uh, other pieces, you know, less focused on compensation itself, more around flexible work environment uh, hereafter. I know I started off the pandemic apologizing to folks for the, the dog bark or the, uh, the toddler screaming in the background. I've since shifted away from apologizing and just saying it is what it is. And a lot of people are in the same boat, so. Yes, agreed. And I think it's, you know, most of us that are, that have been working remotely for the last few months um, have, you know, you've kind of gotten used to it. It's been really interesting. Um, 
So, you know, as this picture kind of represents, when we talk about flexibility, there's really a couple of, of main themes here and it's flexibility from work. So being able to take emergency leave or sick time or caregiving time for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, whether it's yourself or your, your family and, and folks that, you know, you need to take care of because so many things have shut down and everyone's schedules are disruptive. Um, that's one aspect of it. Um, and in addition to that, we talk about flexibility in terms of being able to be flexible when you are working. So kind of the when, what, where, and how you get your job done throughout the day. So we'll, we'll touch on that. And then as well as the different ways that um, organizations have been supporting their employees for flexibility and also for, for caregiving. We've got some examples later in this presentation. So, you know, as, as we've touched on, and, and I, I imagine, you know, most of you probably have some aspect of your uh, employees that are working remotely. Um, you know, before everybody got on, David and I were speaking with Meredith um, and Autumn that, you know, Mercer's offices officially closed back in March, and we've had a kind of a si small number of essential employees, if you will, that needed to be physically in the office, either for technology reasons or um, just certain things like that. And, and we actually had a plan back in the summer to have a voluntary return for a small number of folks. And of course, that's been uh, put on hold indefinitely just because the numbers are going really in the wrong direction for being able to open up the workplace safely. So uh, we imagine that's what you know folks are dealing with all over the country and it's what we've been dealing with and polling all year. Um, but, you know, interestingly, when you look at all the polling and the statistics, you know, again, about over 80% of companies are considering implementing a flexible working environment, mainly because they have to, but um, also it, the, the result of it has not been quite as dramatic and people have, like David said, we found out a way to make it work with through all the distractions and everything else you have to do to get your work done in a day and whatever day means for an individual person. Um, you know, everyone's, for the most part, found a way to make it work. So uh, most companies are, are really looking at this very closely to determine, you know, we've done this now because we have to, but what do we want to do going forward and how are some of the aspects that are favorable of remote working or flexibility uh, perhaps here to stay in some way, shape, or form? Um, so our, our statistic there in the middle that says one in three companies anticipate having half or more of their workforce remote post-COVID. I mean, right now, um, our latest polls showed about 65% still have half or more of theirs um, remote, but that's a pretty significant number to say we, we still expect to have about a third, even when, um, you know, the, the crisis, if you will, is over, because flexibility in some way, shape, or form works both for employees and for companies in, in a lot of ways. And I, we don't have it on the slide, but what I'd seen previously is about before the pandemic, it was more like one in 30 had remote workforce. So it was a very small percentage, you know, that's just grown astronomically. So we'll, it'll be interesting over time to see how that um, continues. Uh, and part of the, I, I think, you know, inertia is a powerful force. Part of the reason why remote working or flexible working just hasn't been quite um, as popular in the past years is it just hasn't been, it hasn't been that widespread and there's always worries about, you know, if we can't see our employees and we can't see what they're doing all day long, how do we know they're really working? How do we know we're getting what we're paying for? You know, when you're in a role that you are able to do remotely and, you know, completely acknowledging that not every role has the ability to be remote off-site, but um, poll after poll again, and it's varied up and down, but um, a very high percentage of employers have come back and said surprisingly that their productivity of their employees has remained the same or actually gotten better since they've been forced to kind of go to this, this environment. Um, you know, I'd say probably from a personal perspective, there, there's pluses and minuses, you know, commuting time, you don't have any more, you know, maybe you're not spending as much time getting ready or be presentable unless you have to be on Zoom all day, like a lot of folks do. Um, so that maybe gives you some time back to be productive. But, you know, the flip side is I know there are a lot of folks who, you know, really want to have that in-person and that collaborative environment. And it, it, it really does help productivity in certain aspects. So I think that'll be another thing that's interesting to see. But, you know, overwhelmingly, I think a lot of the fear that employers had about, 
you know, we can't let people start working from home because we just can't monitor them has really not been borne out. You know, people are able to manage their day and manage their time and still get their work done. So, you know, we think that really will be a big driver in the future about how um, employers structure their workforce and what's allowed. Um, so then moving to the right, you know, over again, 80% of employers do think about flexibility and employees do too, more than just remote working. I mean, I think we tend to focus on working somewhere else, but there are many aspects to flexibility. So that includes the when work gets done, so hours and scheduling, um, how it's done. So again, through technology or other aspects, you know, really being able to do your work from somewhere else. Um, the what is being done, so that gets into areas like job sharing or going perhaps part-time for a while. And then lastly, also who does the work, you know, some, at this point, some organizations are looking at certain roles and perhaps contracting those out or, you know, instead of having them be employees, just depending on the nature of it. You know, and one of the things that um, a lot of people thought when the remote work started is, you know, oh my goodness, everyone's going to get rid of their offices and that expensive real estate now because they don't have to have it. And boy, that's going to save companies a lot of money. Um, you know, that is a factor and we, I think we'll see that um, over time, but actually in all the polling we've done, it's really not a top driver of the, the adopt, wanting to adopt greater flexibility that really has been employee engagement and productivity. Um, because in the labor markets we have now and because uh, of companies, you know, really understanding how essential their employees are and understanding that when everyone in the universe gets thrown a curveball as far as their daily lives and, you know, what they're really concerned about and getting their work done at the same time, um, you know, the employee engagement and the productivity of their employees is really paramount. So, you know, I think over time, a lot of the strategies that people have had to use by necessity will become folded in and built into their uh, their system going forward and their their overall EVP. Um, so we touched on this a little bit. So you know, again, business drivers for allowing flexibility are really clear. Um, you know, number one right now, supporting and retaining your employees that are also caregivers, which are the vast majority of your employees. Uh, and I think everyone's probably seen this story, you know, unfortunately happen over and over again is the number of working parents that are, you know, temporarily or perhaps permanently for a extended period of time having to leave the uh, workforce in order to care for, you know, mostly children, but sometimes also other family members or parents that need help because all of these systems that have been in place to um, help in those areas have also had to shut down or be greatly reduced for you know the host of reasons as far as health and safety goes you know so that's put a huge strain on many families that they're having to deal with um, and oftentimes just because the finances and the practical nature of it you, it comes down to folks don't have a choice because someone's got to be around and to be able to take care of, of their families so you know unfortunately it also still is the case that the vast majority of the time this happens right now, it is women. And there, you know, as everyone knows, there are many reasons for that. You know, in our culture, women are still primarily caregivers, but you know, also sometimes it, it, it ends up being that if you have two or her family, that the, the female partner is the one that has a, a lower paid job. So from a financial standpoint, that's the one that makes sense. Um, but it, it is really something that is concerning and I think employers know it, and the hope is that over time it doesn't, you know, continue, but, you know, it really is a, a tough situation. And, you know, kind of like we've talked about the, the parent gap or the, the, the mom gap for a long time, when, when folks take some time out of work, out of their career to focus on their families and, and child rearing, that over the long run from a financial standpoint, it can really set people and their earnings potential back. So, I mean, I think that is one, one of the things that's really been um, brought out in the last few months about what a, you know, quite a, a tough situation that is. And it has ripple effects all throughout, you know, the country and the economy in, in many aspects. So it's something that I think employers, you know, are really trying to keep an eye on and finding any way you can to hold on to your employees 
Um, because even if you kind of push aside the empathy part of it and wanting to take care of your employees, you know, from an economic standpoint, how much more expensive is it to have to recruit and train um, a new employee than it is to retain somebody you already have? So I think that understanding and balance is something that's really been, been driving what we're seeing. Um, the second point here is, as we kind of touched on earlier, is engagement and performance. You know, I think from the employee standpoint, even before the, the pandemic, but certainly after, you know, working for a company that provides some flexibility in when and how their work gets done, um, you know, really is something that people value and may lead, uh, help your retention for that group of folks. Um, expanded talent pools, another area, you know, again, with, with having more flexibility and uh, potentially a broader workforce that you can pull from, it, it may um, expand the pool of employees that you are able to reach for certain jobs. Um, you know, I've talked to some clients that in, in the past, because they were located in a certain place and they felt very strongly everybody needed to be there, they only recruited from a certain area or they required people who came in to move to that area. And in the last few months, because it literally wasn't possible, but they still had roles to fill, they've had, you know, they out of necessity expanded out their search for talent and are starting to find that, you know, maybe those policies of having people right where they are aren't necessarily what they need to do for every job going forward. So it's, it's one thing to, you know, help you expand out your talent pool as well. And also if there's more flexibility around perhaps looking at job sharing or part-time schedules or, you know, things like that where you're divvying up some roles that maybe used to be a single incumbent, but you can maybe split them into two, you may get more people interested who have not previously wanted to work full-time, you know, or wanted to work part-time or folks who are kind of on a glide path to retirement that maybe want to you know, scale down a little bit, but still are interested in working. And that, that could be a pool of talent that a company, you know, suddenly has, you know, more um, access or appeal to that could really help, you know, with their immediate need and help with training, you know, future people um, to just have a little more flexibility and not having every job be, you know, 100% in person, full time every day. I think it gives you more options. And that reduced real estate and labor costs. I mean, that, that's always a concern. And we touched on that a little bit, but you know, in all the polling we've done, we don't think it's a, a huge driver for the most part. Um, you know, and then to be able to tie it back, a lot of uh, companies have uh, environmental sustainability metrics as part of their mission that they're, they're wanting to, you know, continually monitor and improve upon. You know, you think about cutting down on, on um, in-person commuting, you know, that does save a lot of um, greenhouse gases and emissions and things like that just by taking some cars off the road. So there's a lot of business reasons why flexibility makes sense um, in certain aspects. And it's just gonna be a matter of, you know, kind of figuring out what folks wanna do. Um, you know, when we looked at companies and the strategies they have in polling, about half say they have implemented or they're actively developing a, a flexible strategy for their entire workforce. And another almost 40% said they haven't really done it yet, but they intend to in the next few months. And a, a small majority, about 15% said, you know, nope, what we're doing is work. We don't need to do anything differently. It's kind of business as usual. So that, that's a pretty small majority that, uh, you know, most companies are at least thinking about or, you know, or, and or have put into action some level of flexibility for their employees. Um, you know, another thing that we found is that when you ask these companies with their flexible working strategy, you know, what are they, what are the primary um, things that they're looking at changing and how are they going about doing it? Um, the top five we had was, you know, and also not only what they're doing, but why. Um, partly around, you know, having a more supportive culture. And I think that goes back to make sure that you are um, supporting and retaining your labor market that you have. Um, you know, as part of that, also doing a, uh, many more employee engagement surveys and really just asking employees, you know, what would be valuable to you? What, how, how can we help you? What do you need from us? And shaping those policies around what they're getting because every, every company, you know, has a different workforce and a different um, strategy for what is going to work for them. So it becomes very individualized. It's certainly not one size fits all. Um, 
also, you know, one thing we haven't talked about much yet is with all of the shifts going on, one of the things that's been been really hard for managers is having to, you know, deal with sudden remote working, having a team that maybe you met with in person every week and now you're, you know, always meeting over Zoom or whatever platform you use or over the phone. Um, and on, on top of just the working, you know, with there are so many um, things that people are dealing with just in their personal and every day to day life, you know, that can impact work and everything else. And so, you know, everyone's going through a tough time and really giving manager support on how to help your direct reports deal with all the curveballs and things that are come up that, you know, they maybe don't even know. I mean, and I think having, you know, not having school in person for a big swath of, of um, in places around the country has been one of those things that, you know, it's been really important for companies to do what they can to try and support their employees when their, you know, place where their children go most of the time is not available. And like kind of no end in sight at this point in some places. Um, uh, lastly, the other thing we see a lot of, of folks doing, we'll touch on this in a few slides, is supporting for remote work you know, giving um, either money or some items to help people with their um, places at workplaces at home. So I'll pause there to see, does anyone have any questions or any stories they want to share at this point about what their company's done in terms of flexibility? We've got some examples of what some others have done in a couple slides, so. You want us to just speak up? Sure. Kind of more fun. Yeah. Hey, thanks guys. Good work. Great slides. <laughs> um, we just have some wild stories about people working from odd places like, you know, the person that's European and for years it said, well, you know, couldn't I work part of the year from my home in Europe? And they're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> no way. And this happened and guess what? She's working from Europe. Yep. And it's going great. One of our key employees is getting ready to work from Texas for three or four weeks. You know, I haven't seen him since March, so who really cares? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, those are great examples and what you're seeing everywhere. Um, you know, as we work in consulting and work with people all over the country, that's kind of the nature of what, you know, the remote working lends itself to what, you know, David and I do every day anyhow. So in some ways, other than technology being slow and difficult, sometimes it hasn't been you know, a huge sea change, but I know for, for a lot of others, it is, it is very different and it's good to hear success stories, I think. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, we will keep moving. Um, so this is just kind of a, a, I think a fun snapshot of the, the journey of flexible working so far, what, what people have seen, you know, early on it's, it was, you know, being home and having the flexibility is great. I can plan my day and, and get more and out of it, but then you get the Zoom fatigue. I'm on meetings all day. Like, when am I going to get my actual work done? Because I'm in meetings all day long. And one of the things that I've felt has happened is I also think my volume of email has like tripled since we've all been remote. Because people, I think, just because of the disparate ways and times people are working, everything's email, and it's just hard to keep up with the inbox. So that's been kind of a struggle, you know, someone could have walked down, when you're in the office, somebody can walk down the hall or stick their head in your office and ask you a quick question and it's done. But, you know, currently it's either you get an instant message or you get a text or you get an email and it just becomes another thing you have to kind of work through. So I think that's one of the things that's been, you know, a challenge for some. And we touched earlier on the manager, you know, it, in some ways, in some instances we've seen where um, the manager and um, employee relationship has actually gotten stronger because people are really setting aside specific times to have meetings to to um, check in to see how things are going, you know, which maybe before everything was a little bit more steady state and on a schedule and it was just kind of, um, you know, par for the course. Um, but there, I think, have been more, you know, real conversations and some some connections built because of the situation and the anxiety that everybody's been in and having to kind of pull together. Um, so it's been a mix. I think same thing on the employer side, and, and we've touched on some of these things. There's been, you know, concern about productivity, but most of those haven't been borne out. Um, you know, one thing I think if you focus on the right, there has been, you know, quite an increase documented in people seeking out, 
utilizing behavioral health services from their company, from EAP and things like that. Just trying to find, you know, ways to manage their day, to deal with all the anxiety of the unknown, you know, worrying about being sick. And, and telemedicine too is the other one that, that, you know, it was something that maybe a handful of people used when it was convenient for them. And now that's what everything became. And so, you know, over and over again, all summer, we've, we've had people say, I've never used telemedicine and now I use it all the time. And I can't imagine going actually back to the doctor's office unless I really have to, you know, when I have something minor. So I think those are some of the things that we can talk about. Um, this is really kind of the crux of what we've been talking about, the different dimensions of how uh, flexible working can happen. So what we like to kind of say is, you know, all jobs can flex, not just people who work in an office or work in consulting or, you know, have something that they can really do on their own time, but it's really thinking a little bit more um, in depth or critically about what flexibility can mean. So flexibility on dimensions. So we talked about where, um, I think that's the most common, again, the locations and schedules of when people are getting their work done. Um, the when work gets done is another one that's pretty common. You know, hours and schedules being able to change, you know, not just our Monday through Friday, eight to five, um, but, you know, more. And I think we see this is probably besides the remote working that, that's been forced is that the when, you know, people juggling childcare and, and uh, virtual school and appointments and everything else. You know, I think there are a lot of people who are working, you know, pockets of hours all through the day and some on the weekends just essentially to keep up. But, you know, the flip side is having the flexibility to, you know, be able to step away for a couple hours when you need to, to you know, help your children with school or do something else. Um, on the what front, that's really around uh, job content and sharing. And you know, we've seen an uptick in that. Um, you know, an example is if you've got, you know, a couple of, of people who have been full time, but maybe they need to go part time for a while because of their home situation, you know, perhaps you can condense them in, into one job and they can do alternating schedules. I mean, it's something that's happened like in healthcare and in nursing for a long time. And, and we saw that to even more of an extreme earlier this year and, and ongoing really when you've got certain, like if you're a hospital or a health system and you've got people that work in certain areas that you know, over the spring and summer weren't busy because their practices were essentially shut down because of the elective surgeries where that weren't happening. Um, but being able to take those people and put them, you know, into the hospital or into the ICU unit or into other areas to cover places that they were busy. Um, so I think that thought process and that, you know, kind of looking at who are my employees now, what can I do with them to make everybody, um, you know, more effective or, you know, moving them from one place to another, um, what can I do there? And actually even like within our, the group that David and I work with, we've done some of that this year um, where we've had some of our analysts, you know, farmed out, if you will, to other offices around the country and working on projects and other practice areas of Mercer that, you know, maybe in a typical year we wouldn't have had capacity to do, but this year we did. So, you know, in some way it's been a great, you know, it's a great way to use the resources that you already have um, and just being able to be agile and shift them to the need that you have at the moment. And, 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 and at least in our experience, it's been a pretty positive situation because it's given our folks a chance to work with some different people and on some different projects and it's helped to keep them engaged. Um, you know, the scaling and the technology, sometimes that can be just around again, where and how you can do it. I mean, we all probably are Zoom experts at this point. Um, probably nobody was eight months ago. So, you know, that, that's a piece of it. And then lastly, that who, we talked about this on the last slide a little bit, the roles and non-traditional workforce, you know, maybe being able to pick up uh, more people who don't want to work full time, but have great skill sets that you need to plug in at the moment, depending on your needs. Um, but it really is balancing, you know, the employee and employer perspectives to help the organization be flexible. Um, and, you know, the, the, the job sharing and the compressed work weeks are some of the, the things that we see. And this, this slide kind of gives some thumbnail examples of what, you know, these can look like. So the where, the location, I mean, I think this is what we've all been talking about. I work a few days in the office and work from home otherwise, you know, or home or from Europe or from wherever um, makes sense for you at the time, you know, being able to do that. Um, you know, the when is, you know, again, maybe evenings, weekends, getting your time in when you need to, 
and working around the other obligations you have during the day. Um, the scaling technology example, and this is uh, more of an idea of you have a busy season and a slower season, which I think this happens a lot in certain pockets and industries already where you have a busy season. So you may be working, you know, a lot, but then other times of years, you're able to pull back. So I think it's, it's kind of seeing this example and, and deciding, you know, is this process something that we can implement in other, you know, non-traditional areas where you kind of have surge and, and less uh, busy times. Um, the John Cod job content and sharing, you know, again, that's potentially doing job sharing or splitting shifts, which we've seen a, a lot of this year. Um, and then again, the, the alternate workforce, you know, perhaps picking up some groups you haven't had or deciding that, you know, some functions you can either outsource or contract if that works better for your organization. Um, so pivoting a little bit to um, supporting needs of caregivers, here is our, here are some examples of, you know, some pretty large companies and things uh, that they've done to help their employees with caregiving needs. Um, and, you know, we've seen this at other companies as well. And I think a lot of it, you know, of course, excuse me, goes to finances particularly. But, you know, one of the things we've seen is, and, and actually um, Mercer did this as well as the option, particularly over the, the summer for um, employees to take like a sabbatical or to go to reduced hours for a period of time. Um, like the PwC example was four to six week sabbatical for a 20% pay. So it's a way to, I guess, help keep your employees engaged. You know, you're not getting rid of a position or a person, but it's kind of helping, I think from the company standpoint, of course it's reduced costs because you're paying 20% salary. Um, you're getting, you know, no work in theory from those folks during that time, but you know, it's a way to kind of bridge the gap with somebody may need some, some time off um, and to not have to go through you know, termination and rehire and all of that um, to help people with specific situations, especially when they came on suddenly. Um, extending uh, backup care, we've seen that as well, you know, trying to partner with some um, agencies or firms, um, Bright Horizons is one that I know is a national firm, to do backup child care if it's needed. Um, and what we saw a lot too was, you know, at, having people take, you know, just extending or modifying your leave policies to allow people to take more time off, whether it's paid or unpaid. You know, again, really with the idea of being empathetic to their employee situation, um, you know, not wanting to reduce their workforce significantly, but, but find ways of balancing all of that to bridge the, the gap. Um, and this is a little bit more information too about, you know, specifically childcare. Um, you know, this is a U.S. Chamber of Commerce study from uh, a, a little while ago that, you know, 40% of employers were not confident that everybody in their workforce was going to return after the pandemic, which oftentimes we talked about earlier is heavily related to childcare and, you know, having to make sure that you've got all your bases covered when school's not in session, because it's just not something you can turn on and off every day. You really have to have a plan for that. Um, Again, this the child care has been really hard, and I think that's been, you know, one of the the places where everybody's really struggling. That unfortunately is is led people to have to drop out of the workforce at least for a period of time. So the the chart on the right was a spot survey we did that, you know, what companies experienced following school closures, and you know, forty percent said their employees had requested a leave of absence. Again, it goes back to you know something's got to give. Um, and, you know, over 35% said so they've had full-time employees request to go part-time, you know, to hopefully continue in the role, but to do something a little bit different. Um, you know, and again, unfortunately, you know, a little over 20% had, have had people leave because of this. So, you know, we're in the middle of it and it's not anything I think that's easy to solve, but, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it, this cycles out you know, even for next year, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of us earlier this year thought, well, surely by next year, it'll be all straightened out. Um, I don't know, hard to know. I know um, I've got a, a, a friend that works for GE Appliances here in Louisville and three weeks ago, they already came out and said they're gonna continue their remote working through June to coincide with school year because they felt like, 
I, th I don't think they specifically said that, but I think the June timeframe, you know, it aligns with school calendar and it was to really give their employees that big heads up that of, you know, we understand that you are likely going to have your children doing NTI for an extended period of time, maybe the whole year, or at least on and off through the year. Um, so they, they continued their remote policy through then and are going to reevaluate in the summer. Well, good idea to tell them that now so they don't quit thinking January they're going to have to. Right. I, I really do think that is a good example of, you know, trying to be proactive and doing what you can to, to help support your workforce. Um, and this is just a little bit more information about, you know, what are employees doing to address childcare needs? And, you know, of course, the, the biggest part is allowing changes to schedules to basically just please, you know, get your work done as you can, when you can. And communication around it, of course, is, is really key to all of it, too, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, it's got a couple more minutes. Um, we'll go through. This is just a slide that talks about, um, aside from child care, what are organizations doing to support remote work? And about 40% are doing some kind of financial support. Um, there's some examples of public companies on the right. What, what we found is these hold up pretty well. I mean, a lot of Actually, a lot of companies do nothing because they don't expect it to be very long term. The ones that are doing something are most likely to give like a one time stipend or allowance just to buy either some equipment that's needed or um, furniture or chairs or things like that just to help people with their um, remote setup at home. Um, and, I, and, you know, lastly, I think this is something that has come up a lot around, well, if you're going to have a remote workforce, and maybe over the long term, you're going to have much more of a remote workforce, what does that do to your pay structure? So kind of be bringing it back to the, the compensation aspect of where people work. Um, so in, in this latest poll, we asked about if you have remote workers, and maybe for the foreseeable future, are you going to change how you're going to pay them? Um, and, you know, the answers on the left were, you know, about 35% said, we're going to continue to pay at the mar the home office location rate. Um, not quite 20 said we're going to shift to pay at the home working wherever that is rate. Um, again, about 15% said no, nope, we pay at the national rate. We don't really take location into account. And then about another third, you know, either doesn't know or it doesn't really have to deal with it because they don't have uh, people in those situations. But, you know, this has been, it's always been kind of a, a big issue when, when you talk about Silicon Valley and the high cost of, of labor there. Um, that Silicon Valley and New York City historically have always been the two that, you know, in theory pay a premium because the cost of living there is higher and that goes to cost of labor. But, you know, what, what we're finding is that, you know, really it comes down to your compensation strategy and, and for the most part, most companies are still going to say, you know, we are going to pay for where our office is. Um, a lot of those may have, even if they allow remote working that hasn't typically been remote to continue, what we're hearing is um, there may be like a radius around where the office is. So we'll allow remote working, but we still expect people to be able to come into the office when needed, you know, even if it's um, you know, a day or two a month. So that kind of gives you an X mile radius around where you are. So maybe it's not quite city, but it's a regional um, pay market. So that maybe expands it out a little bit. But, um, you know, really, if that doesn't go into your, your strategy, what we're seeing is, is really moving to uh, national market rates. So you're not necessarily, you know, looking at just one particular area and you know national data is what we really see for top level employees anyway and it goes back to kind of the labor market and where you're sourcing your talent from and where you're competing um, so for a lot of jobs it really isn't national you're going to do a national search but you know it is something that is kind of becoming top of mind if you've got folks that have been living in higher cost places and now they're going to live in you know somewhere that's much more of a national um, labor market area, not as high a cost of living. Is there an obligation? Does a company feel like they need to, you know, adjust pay? You know, and again, we've talked to organizations about that. I mean, very few say, um, yes, we have a strict geographic 
differential on pay and we're going to cut pay if you move somewhere else. Cutting pay is probably not something you're going to see very often. Um, if they change their strategy and see this as being an issue, though, it may be something that it kind of evolves over time. So maybe someone who moves from a high cost to a lower cost doesn't get the same level of increases over time because of that differential, you know, or maybe they stay put and as you get more people in other areas, you implement your newer strategy and maybe looking at national market instead of local or regional um, to kind of even out over time, but something we're just not seeing a lot of drastic changes. Um, so that really kind of wraps up the flexibility section. It gives us a few minutes, but you know, the, the the high points of all of it are, you know, if you haven't, if you don't have a strategy and think you need one, you know, it's really something that everyone's looking at right now and thinking through what flexibility means, not just necessarily remote working, but how work gets done and the different aspects of that. Um, you know, if having remote workers is new and maybe people are moving and looking at the different market rates you know, on your compensation strategy, that is something else to consider. And, you know, Lastly, if, if you are going to have a, a fair number of people working remotely, you know, do you need to look at your policies and strategies to help support whatever that looks like for your, your company? I believe that is the end of our slides. I know we have a few minutes left. Um, so we're happy to answer any other questions or go from there. I can't see the checks. I was sharing my screen, so I don't know if there are questions there. I don't think we have any questions right now, but if anyone has any, certainly you can unmute or you can put your question in the chat. This was wonderful information. Thank you. Well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really good. Well, I had a, an example of that crazy geographic difference. I had a couple from San Francisco, both working for San Francisco companies, living in downtown Lexington in a condo that I own paying $1,500 a month, and it would have been four to 5000 in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. And they were making buck. <laughs> They're really doing well. <laughs> it's yep, a good it job if you can get it. It works that way, for sure. Yeah, and we have actually, another, I think Mercer has a, a point of view, kind of white paper that was published somewhat recently on flexible working. So um, we're happy to share that. Um, with Meredith and she can distribute it out to the group if it's something you all would be interested in and the slide deck as well. Yeah, that'd be wonderful if you don't mind to do that. Yep, we can certainly do that. Um, and you'll notice that Autumn has just put in the certification codes in the chat box. So if you need those, just make sure you grab those. Um, a couple things, we, we did record today's um, meeting, so we will share that with those that have attended. Um, and we'll make sure to include those credit codes as well when we email that out. As Lisa said, she's going to send me that white paper, so we'll include that as well when we send that. And then, as always, um, we really um, appreciate and welcome any feedback that you have, so there will be a survey coming around as we send out each time. Um, we are always interested in any topics that you'd like for us to see to have presented at upcoming meetings, so please, please share us with us your feedback, um, interest, um, anything of that nature. We, we certainly read those um, when we get them.